Listening practice section one. You will hear a conversation between an IELTS candidate and an IELTS administrator. Look at the questions one to five. Listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions one to five. Good afternoon. I'm applying for a master's program at the University of Exeter in the UK. I'm planning to register for the IELTS exam at your centre next month. I have some questions I'd like to ask you before I register, if that's okay. Certainly. Would you be taking the academic module? I think so, but I'll have to contact the university just to make sure. You'll probably need the academic because most universities don't accept the general training, and anyway, the procedures to register for the exam are the same for both the general and the academic modules. Good. My first question is whether I sit all parts of the exam on the same day. I don't live here, you see. And for me, it would be more convenient to do all the papers on the same day.、Hmm. Unfortunately, the speaking part is scheduled for Thursdays, and reading, writing, and listening tests take place on Saturdays. We can't change the days, I'm afraid.、Hmm. That's a pity. Well, never mind. What sort of documents do I need to bring in order to register? You'll have to fill in the IELTS application form. And bring an ID, a copy of your ID, and two passport-sized photos on a white background. Will any ID do? We only accept original passports and national IDs. That's good to know. Did you say that reading, writing, and listening are scheduled for Saturday? That's right. Will I get a break in between the papers? I'm afraid there aren't any breaks between the papers. Each paper. Takes an hour to complete, so it's three hours straight through. You'll first do listening, and then reading, followed by the writing test. This is a standard requirement from Cambridge. Now look at the questions six to ten. As the conversation continues, complete questions six to ten. Okay, and how soon after the test can I pick up my results? It takes thirteen calendar days for the results to be processed. Can you let me know how much it is and the form of payment? The examination fee is two hundred US dollars. You can pay by credit or debit card. We also accept checks. We only accept cash as a form of payment in exceptional circumstances. And one last question: Can I mail you the application documents? Certainly. You can send all the documents by registered mail to our address, forty-seven Clover Place, New Rochelle, New York. Could you spell New Rochelle for me, please? Certainly. N E W R O C H E L L E. Could I have the zip code as well? Sure. Our zip code is one zero eight zero six. Thanks. You can also email us at i inquiry at examsmail dot com or phone us at three two five. Nine zero eight two. I think that's all. 
Thank you very much for all the information. Bye. You're welcome. Goodbye. Listening practice section two. You are going to listen to two students talking about a presentation on time management. Look at the questions one and two. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions one and two. Hi, Mark. What are you doing? Hi, Lucy. Well, I, I'm preparing this seminar on time management. I'm supposed to do a presentation on the topic next week. Ironic, isn't it? I'm probably the worst student when it comes to time management. I don't think you're that bad compared to some other people I know. Do you need some help with it? Yeah. I just don't know where to start, to be honest. When are you doing the presentation? I'm supposed to hand in the draft on Wednesday at 11 a.m. The presentation is scheduled for 10 a.m. this Friday. Now look at the questions 3 to 10. As the conversation continues, complete questions 3 to 10. That's not too bad. This gives you the whole weekend to prepare. Let's brainstorm some ideas, shall we? Do you want to get a pen and paper to jot down some thoughts? I think you should start with a broad general statement. For example, I read somewhere that organising time is a skill like learning to drive or tying your shoelaces. Then you could move on to discussing the common problems people have with managing time. That's not a bad idea. One of the common problems is putting things off. Yeah, you could also mention some common signs of this symptom, such as last-minute holiday shopping, pulling off visits to the doctors or the dentists. Another problem is relying too much on your memory and not writing things down. Do you mean not keeping a diary or a planner to plan the tasks? That's right. For example, writing down what I need to do in a diary or planner helps me remember what I need to do and makes me more focused on the tasks for the day. Good idea. That reminds me of something I've been meaning to do for a while now. Anyway, I should also include some advice on how to deal with the problem, shouldn't I? Sure, you can talk about some ways of stopping procrastination. I guess making a to-do list can help one focus on what needs to be done. Definitely. Another way to deal with the problem is to prioritise and do the hardest job first, the one which requires the most effort and concentration. Also, my tutor recommended that I should break big projects into small parts with a specific goal. Having an action plan has worked for me. I usually make a list of small tasks I need to do to achieve a goal. Sometimes I just don't feel like getting down to work because a task seems too overwhelming for me to even think about. This technique helps me reduce psychological pressure. If I think of a project as a set of easily achievable tasks, don't you think? I know what you mean. I often feel like that myself with the statistics project I've been doing this term. I'm well behind and the deadline is next week. I think setting deadlines and sticking to them can help one to achieve goals. You can discuss this aspect in your presentation too. A good point. Setting deadlines 
can also help one become more realistic about the time it takes to do tasks. Another point you could include is how to deal with interruptions. Okay, I guess blocking in time to handle unpredictable interruptions can help one stay focused. Not just that, some interruptions, such as phone calls, can be easily avoided by using answering machines, for example. Saying no, which is one of the most useful words in English, is also very effective. It can be tough sometimes, but you've got to learn to say it nicely but firmly. I think you've got enough ideas here to start with. Definitely. Thanks a lot for your help. I just need to type the ideas up and I think I'm all set. Do you think you can lend me your laptop for a couple of hours? Mm, I'm afraid I can't. I've got to finish my own project. Never mind. I'll use one at the library. You certainly know how to say no. <laughs> Learned it the hard way. Got to go now. Good luck with the presentation. Cheers. See you later. Listening practice section three. You are going to listen to a radio program on sleep deprivation. Look at the questions one to five. Now listen to the first part of the program and answer questions one to five. With us in the studio today are Dr. Peter Collins, a senior lecturer in the Department of Psychology at the University of Chicago, and Helen Gardner, the author of the book Deep Sleep. They've come to our studio to discuss the effects of sleep deprivation and also give some tips to the sleep deprived on how to deal with the problem. Welcome to the studio, Helen and Peter. Now, Peter, what are the reasons for sleep deprivation and how can it affect our lives? Well, the research into sleep deprivation started in the late 50s and has been going on ever since. Many researchers link sleep deprivation with electricity, television and computers, which have enabled humans to work 24-7. Before electricity was invented, People's body clocks were synchronised with the sun's schedule and the average time they spent sleeping was eight to nine hours a night. By 1975, that average was down to seven hours and today one third of us sleep less than six hours a day. This leads to a condition called chronic sleep deprivation, which basically means going for extended periods of time with less sleep than your body needs. Chronic sleep deprivation can cause a variety of physical and psychological problems. At its most basic level, loss of sleep can make us more irritable and less efficient and can affect long-term memory and concentration, which can result in more accidents. According to the latest research into sleep deprivation, sleep deprivation is the main reason for 3% of plane crashes 10% of domestic accidents, 20% of accidents at work and 45% of all traffic accidents. Research into the physical effects of chronic sleep deprivation suggests more serious and significant long-term complications. Research from my university, the University of Chicago, has shown that sleep deprivation interferes with how the human body regulates insulin and sugar metabolism, which can increase the risk of diabetes. People who are sleep deprived have weakened immune systems and are more prone to viruses and other kinds of infections. People who don't get enough sleep have cognitive problems or difficulties processing and assimilating new information. Lack of sleep 
affects long-term memory and slows down such abilities as judgment and reaction times. Some researchers link sleep deprivation with obesity, indicating that sleep disorders and eating disorders are often linked. Now look at the questions 6 to 10. As the program continues, answer questions 6 to 10. Helen, you've done a fair amount of research for your recent book on helping people deal with sleeping problems. Could you give our listeners some tips on managing their sleep? Well, if you spend several hours a night tossing and turning in bed, trying to fall asleep, you first have to find out how much sleep you need. To do so, you'll need to try and sleep six to nine hours a night. Set aside three days for the experiment. It's best to do it on a long weekend or a holiday to ensure it doesn't get interrupted. During the experiment, you should go to bed at the same time every night and give yourself six, seven, eight or nine hours of sleep. Then monitor the way you feel throughout the day to find out how many hours of sleep you need in order to feel your best. Once you find out how much sleep you need, you can work on improving the quality of your sleep. The main secret here is to allow yourself one or two hours to relax before going to bed. You may want to try and have a warm shower or bath before going to bed. Doing some quiet activities such as reading or filing can help some people relax. A warm drink in bed helps to induce sleepiness. Some people take up yoga or meditation to help them relax at night. Different techniques will work for different people, so it's best to experiment and find the one that suits you best. You should definitely avoid using technology before going to bed. Activities such as playing video games, watching TV and others which require you to use your attention can stop you from falling asleep. Avoid eating before going to bed. A late dinner can disrupt your sleep. Not only is going to bed with a heavy stomach bad for digestion and can make you overweight, but it can also keep you awake for hours. Caffeine-rich drinks can increase your heart rate, which can stop you from falling asleep. Energy drinks also have the same effect on your body. You should avoid drinking these at night. The same goes for vigorous physical exercise, such as weightlifting or working out on a treadmill. In many cases, you can reset your body clock and make it tick for you by changing your lifestyle. If your sleep deprivation is severe, it's always best to seek professional advice and get an appointment with your doctor, who might prescribe you sleeping pills. Thank you, Helen. We'll be back after the break and we'll be answering questions we've received from our listeners. Listening Practice Section 4 you are going to listen to a lecture on language learning. Look at the questions 1 to 5. Now listen to the first part of the lecture and answer questions 1 to 5. 
This is the first in our series of lectures on language learning. The topic I'd like to deal with today is what makes a successful language learner? There's been a lot of research into what makes some people learn a language faster than others. In this lecture, I'll summarize the main findings of the research into the subject. There are many factors that influence how quickly one learns a foreign language, of which exposure to the target language seems to be one of the most important factors to consider. It's this factor which determines the speed of learning a language, especially among those people who learn a foreign language outside the classroom. There are more people who did not learn a second language or a third language in the classroom, and I think that understanding how learners successfully learn languages without the help of a teacher can provide us with the key to how to become a successful language learner. Let's look then at the characteristics of a successful language learner. Motivation seems to be one of the key factors. Research into motivation has identified two main types, instrumental motivation and integrative motivation. Instrumental motivation is the kind of motivation that encourages people to learn a language for practical reasons, such as getting a job or passing an examination. Learners with this kind of motivation intend to use the target language as a tool or instrument to help them achieve a goal. Integrative motivation is what encourages learners to learn a language in order to communicate and socialize with others who speak the language. The primary aim for learners with integrative motivation is to use the language to integrate and identify with the community that uses the language. Immigrants, or people who are married to speakers of another language, are motivated in this way. Although most people have mixed motivation, research into language learning and acquisition suggests that integrative motivation produces much better results and is an important characteristic of successful language learners. Now look at the questions 6 to 10. As the lecture continues, answer questions 6 to 10. Personality is another important factor in language learning. One does not need to be an extrovert to learn a foreign language, but willingness to experiment and take risks is essential. Introverted or anxious learners who are afraid of making mistakes find it harder to learn a language. Good language learners will try to experiment with different ways of learning vocabulary or grammar until they find the way that suits them best. Language is a complex system. Successful language learners often design complex learning systems to master a language. They think about how they learn and organize their learning accordingly. They develop their own learning style and use a range of learning skills such as efficient revision techniques, systems for learning and organizing vocabulary, the ability to monitor their own speech and the ability to plan their learning. Finally, age is another major factor to be borne in mind. Children seem to be in the best position to learn a foreign language rapidly and with the best results. Older learners can also be very successful and become proficient at using a language. Adult learners who make decisions about their learning and are independent of the teacher, who are analytical and aware of how they learn 
and who take responsibility for their learning stand a very good chance of learning a foreign language successfully. You now have half a minute to check your answers.